Hey, this is Jeff Perazzo, Trent Fernandez Mercer from Power Rangers Dino Thunder, and you're watching Pomelo Retro with Matt Fisher. Next up, Dino Thunder versus Abba Ranger. Check it out. This video is being done slightly out of sequence, but it's being done that way for two reasons. Firstly, because you voted for it, but also because it's a season that I've wanted to cover for a while now. The reason for starting this whole series in the first place was to explore the differences between the show that I loved as a child and its Japanese counterpart. But as I got further into it, I realised that it's not so easy to answer, because the differences can be huge. And with Power Rangers having a continuity throughout, we can always go deeper. But now that we've rounded off the Zordon era, and also the series that rounded off some of the additional elements from it, we can go out of sequence, and so my attention is drawn to Power Rangers Dino Thunder. Not only is it a return to high school students with dinosaur zords, like the original series was, but it also brings the full-time return of Tommy Oliver, the original Green Ranger, White Ranger, Red Zeo, and Red Turbo Ranger. So this season is of particular interest for someone my age, who was a huge fan of the original Mighty Morphin seasons, as this seems, at least on the surface, like it has some interesting parallels. But how many are there, and how does it compare to its Japanese counterparts? Is it comparable to Zhu Ranger? Well, there's only one way to find out. The story actually starts with Tommy running from dino bad guys in the middle of the jungle, before jumping from a cliff and then the entire island blows up. So that's where Jurassic World 2 got the idea from. We skip forward to a few years later and we see Tommy again, this time with a rather conspicuous Power Ranger-like symbol on his satchel. He heads into a high school where we learn that since retiring as a ranger, and I assume also failing as a racing driver, he became a doctor of paleontology. I wonder what inspired that career choice? He's decided to settle down and teach science to high school students, although he's actually teaching paleontology, which is quite unique for a high school curriculum. I wish that was an option I had. We're first introduced to Cassidy, a stereotypically bubbly and self-centred cheerleader type, who is the presenter of the school's student TV channel, and Devon, her cameraman. Missing from the class is Connor, the stereotypical cocky and chauvinistic jock type. Don't worry about Randall. She's a woman! And women are just... growing up girls. Need I say more? We also have our geeky Billy type guy, Ethan, who hacks into the school's sprinkler system, and the Avril Lavigne early 2000s rocker girl type, Kira. They're given a week's detention for skipping class, setting off the sprinklers, even though there's no evidence that Ethan did it, and weirdly, playing guitar without permission. Tommy is put in charge of the detention, but had plans to go to a museum. The bitchy principal orders them to serve their detention at the museum, which hardly sounds like a punishment to me. That's a field trip. They arrive outside, and that's some good early 2000s CG right there. Bear in mind Jurassic Park was making digital dinosaurs over a decade before this. Granted it might have had a bigger budget, but still. The museum is closed under new management by a guy called Anton Mercer, a name Tommy seems to recognise. Meanwhile, the students are told to look around the outside of the building, and if they find anything prehistoric, Tommy will suspend detention for the rest of the week. I'm not so sure releasing them into the woods on your first day as a teacher is a good idea. Inevitably they run into trouble falling into some holes in the ground, and then... I'm sorry, what now? So Tommy is attacked by a T-Rex, attempts to give it a roundhouse kick, and then runs away jumping into his jeep, locking the doors, despite it not having a roof. He spends way too long trying to do his seatbelt up, and then we end up with another 
Jurassic Park moment with an epic car chase. Must go faster. Ending with a T-Rex whacking his head on a low bridge. It turns out though that this was actually a robot. Meanwhile, the detentionees are still underground making their own discoveries. This screams Jurassic Park to me. You're telling me? They find a stegosaurus, which ends up opening a secret door into a lab where they find, and steal, some coloured gems. But only really in the hope of getting out of detention, not because they're gemstones. We cut to somewhere, and a familiar looking island emerges from the sea, with some familiar looking dino bad guys mentioning the stones. Some of the grunts are transported to the students and give chase, and it appears they're now somehow really deep into the woods, despite only being supposed to be looking around the outside of the museum. There's signs of superhero-ness, with Kira having a scream that can send the grunts flying, Ethan having super hard skin, and Connor being able to move at flash-like speed. Tommy turns up, but they decide not to tell him about the gems, but the next day, Kira actually offers to give hers up. Cassidy and Devon have apparently been doing some digging for dirt on Tommy, contacting Angel Grove High to see if they can find out any information. Which is a bit weird, but she suspects something is odd about him, and she's getting into the spirit of investigative journalism. Although, I think a high school TV channel would have to have some kind of teacher supervision, and an investigation into a teacher's personal life probably isn't cricket. And to be fair, Cassidy's not stupid. She mentions that it's weird that our three detentionees are hanging out together, even stealing my joke, calling Kira an Avril wannabe. She may be prissy, but she's not dumb. The Grunts, or Tyrannodrones as we find out they're called, turn up at the school and kidnap Kira, while Devon fails to catch it on camera. Connor and Ethan head for Tommy's house, assuming he's the only one that could potentially help, because reasons. They enter Tommy's house, and Connor ends up opening a secret stairwell with a hidden switch in a T-Rex model. They go down the stairs to find themselves in the same lab they were in the previous night. They explain what happened to Kira and admit that they stole the gems. Meanwhile, Kira is being interrogated by not only the dino guy, but someone that looks a lot like the bitchy principal, apparently known as Elsa, not that one, and a knight called Zeltrax. Kira manages to give them the slip and escape, while Tommy, Ethan and Connor head for... somewhere? It turns out Tommy actually created the Tyrannodrones. He was working with Anton Mercer to experiment with dinosaur cyborgs. Mercer disappeared, their lab was attacked, and research was supposedly destroyed by someone called Mesagog. Kira appears from a portal, but so does the knight and some Tyrannodrones, although the battle doesn't last too long. When they return to school, Zeltrax begins an attack using things called Biozords. Tommy takes our would-be rangers back to his lab and explains that these are cyborgs created using dinosaur DNA by him. There's no connection of the Zords to Zordon, but presumably Tommy kept the name out of respect. He also created three dino morphers, which allow them to morph into fully-fledged Power Rangers. The power came from the gems, which formed part of a meteorite that destroyed the dinosaurs back in ye old dino times. Kira, Ethan and Conan were chosen by the gems, and the gems are now merging with their DNA. Mesagog can still take them, but only by destroying those that carry them, and the morphers are now needed to be able to handle the fight that's now coming their way. They morph and face Zeltrax for control of the Biozords. Each ranger also has their own personal weapon, the Tyranno Staff, the Terror Grip, and the Tricera Shield, which can also combine to create a Z-Rex Blaster. But there are other weapons that are introduced later, like the Thunder Max Sabre. So, much like the original series, you have a Jockey Red Ranger based on a Tyrannosaurus Rex, a Geeky Blue Ranger based on a Triceratops, and a Female Ranger, although yellow this time rather than pink, based on a Pterodactyl. Apparently the Morphers have been designed to communicate with the Zords, with each in turn being tamed by the Rangers, and the three merge together to form a Megazord. This one's able to merge with other Zords to create different forms. Obviously the most striking thing about all of this is that now we're in the 21st century, much of the practical effects have been replaced by CG, but not all of it. Obviously we still have practical effects for much of the enemies. In fact, the Mesagog costume is actually quite impressive. 
and there is also still hints of a practical effect version of the Megazord too. And as the season goes on, we do see more use of more traditional tokusatsu battle footage, which is good because the CG doesn't hold up very well. And to be honest, it probably didn't look that impressive at the time either. After the battle, Tommy reveals his system for keeping the Morphers hidden during the Rangers' everyday lives. The gems form part of a bracelet that also doubles up as a communicator, with the Morphers made available when required. In Episode 3, we're introduced to a modern take on the Angel Grove juice bar, known as Haley's Cyberspace, which is actually an awesome place to be, with retro arcade cabinets, live music, and gaming booths. Tommy also explains that the island explosion caused many of his inventions to be scattered around the local area. So it seems that Tommy is a bit like Billy from Power Rangers Zeo. Rather than just a ranger, he's become someone with genius level understanding of how the ranger's powers and tech work, even developing his own. They find some eggs that Tommy had developed, which hatch to reveal the Raptor Riders, essentially mechanised raptors one can ride like a Final Fantasy chocobo. And now I'm getting even more Jurassic World vibes. In retaliation, Mesagog fires up a genetic randomizer to start pumping out the monsters of the week, which is actually a really interesting explanation for where the monsters come from and why they are the way that they are. Essentially, it's like a cross between Jurassic Park and the fly, with random bits of DNA mutated to create something unique. Although, it doesn't always quite make sense, like in one episode where she uses a playing card to bring the monster to real life. The cards don't contain DNA. It's not like I could take this Pikachu card, run it through a machine, and then just out pops. Pikachu! Interesting. This episode also introduces Trent, a character that will become more important as the series goes on. In episode 4, Tommy is kidnapped by Mesagog to try and retrieve a fourth gem from inside a rock, so the other rangers enter his lab and Ethan hacks into his computer. There they find a video diary which explains that he was originally a Power Ranger. We then get a brief history of the Power Rangers from the Mighty Morphin era Green Ranger, the transformation into the White Ranger, the Ninja Powers, Zeo, Turbo, and his eventual handing over of the powers to TJ, which is cool, but it does seem a bit weird that Tommy just happens to have all this footage of his life up to this point. It would have made more sense if it was just Tommy talking to a camera, and then for exposition's sake, the audience got to see all this footage, but the character seeing it in the show does feel a bit weird. Haley then turns up and explains that it was actually her who built the Morphers, so perhaps she's our Billy-type character, or possibly more like Alpha. Apparently, after Tommy gave up the powers of the Red Turbo Ranger, he went to college, where he met Haley and through his research, he eventually found the Dino Gems. Tommy continues his video diary, talking through the remainder of Turbo, In Space, Lost Galaxy, Lightspeed Rescue, and so on. Now, this is essentially just a clip show, but it shows how Power Rangers has much more of a continuity than Super Sentai does. We may only be a few episodes in, but already, quite often, the actors' native New Zealand accents start to seep through as in fact the actors who play Connor, Kira, Cassidy, Haley, Devon, Elsa, and many of the other smaller characters are all from New Zealand, because much of the show was actually filmed there, rather than the US. Most shows since Ninja Storm have had principal photography filmed on that side of the world, the worst example of this being the editor at the TV station. You're a lead story for the 6 o'clock news, and try not to screw it up. This isn't that much of an issue, but it does stand out, particularly when there's a kid who clearly can't handle an American accent, so they dub him over with an obviously grown woman's voice. I don't have your money. I'll be back here at six with the footage. No lie, you have my word. As the Rangers head out to save Tommy, they're given their new Raptor cycles. These will be required to speed through portals, on this occasion one that takes them to Mesagog's island fortress. But in the meantime, we get to see some pretty impressive action sequences, except for the fact that Connor's stunt double is at least twice his size. They manage to save Tommy, but not before he grabs the stone that contains the additional gem. The stone is smashed, and the new dino gem chooses Tommy to become its master. Fortunately, Tommy just happens to have an additional dino morpher ready, 
and joins the lineup as the new Black Ranger. The Black Ranger Zord is the Brachia Zord, which happens to be a carrier Zord, much like Titanus in the original Mighty Morphin series. But there's also a Cephla Zord, which is able to merge with Megazord, using its head for a power punch attack. Incidentally, in this series, monsters are made giant through the use of a Hydro Regenerator, once they're initially blown up. In Episode 6, Anton Mercer re-emerges, and he's apparently Trent's father, but he seems oddly cold with Tommy. Although he's not Trent's biological father, his parents died in a cave-in on a paleontological dig, so Anton took him in. In Episode 8, we're introduced to Goldenrod, created from Zeltrax's DNA. Not that he lasts very long, but in the battle we get a look at Tommy's Brachio staff and its array of attacks, including Windstrike, which is more like a lightning storm, Earthquake, which traps monsters in a ridge, and Fire Strike, which brings flames up from below the ground, which is somewhat reminiscent of the Zord's deaths in Mighty Morphin. In one episode, he's even able to conjure up a tidal wave. Throughout these early episodes, Trent becomes increasingly unsure about what his father is up to. In episode 9, we get our first real indication that Elsa and the Principal are the same person, apart from looking exactly the same, that is. She manages to find a dinosaur egg, well, two actually, although one is just a decoy. In the real egg is a new dinosaur, the Dimetrazor, which begins attacking little Tokyo. See what you did there. But Tommy is somehow able to use his Morpher to bring the Zord on the side of the Rangers, adding a circular saw weapon to the Megazord's growing arsenal. Already there's a noticeable change in pace over older seasons. Things happen so quickly it's just like, oh no, Zeltrax has a son, now there's two of them, oh never mind, he's dead. Oh no, Anton Mercer's bought the Cyber Cafe and he's going to, oh never mind, Trent blocked it. Oh no, there's a new Zord that's so powerful it can, oh never mind, Tommy fixed it. It's not that it's bad, it just kind of makes your head spin a little bit. In episode 10, they find another egg. It hatches into a Stegazord under Ethan's control, and acts kind of more like a traditional carrier Zord, except in this instance, it specifically acts as a surfboard. Okay, I suppose with the wider use of CG, it means that you're able to bring more things like this in, as you don't need to make practical costumes for them all but it does mean that the Zords feel less important the more that you throw into the mix. But it also means that you can make and sell a lot more toys. Having said that, they do still create practical effects for parts of them at least. After trying in vain to get a decent story for student TV, Cassidy and Devon attempt to get a job at a TV network. In doing so, they promise to find the real identity of the Power Rangers. I get a bit of a Spider-Man Daily Bugle feel here, and I like the callback to all these other IPs. We also find out why Anton Mercer has been acting so sketchy. There's a portal to the island inside his office. Meanwhile, back on the island, Elsa and the rest of the bad guys have managed to find another rock that contains a Dino Gem. Not that they're able to extract this one either. Trent notices his father leaving and follows through the portal to the lab, where he finds a bracelet and a morpher that latch themselves onto his arm, and he begins to get visions of another ranger. Speaking of which, the White Ranger soon shows up, destroying a monster and facing down the previously established Power Rangers. But the writers thought that this would be a good opportunity to sneak in... well... a penis joke. Who is it? And how come he gets the fat helmet? The morpher and the power that it contains are supposedly evil, and so the rangers have a new antagonist. There's also a bunch of new dino eggs, one of which hatches into the Parasaur Zord, which Haley is able to get control of under Tommy's command, which adds a giant scissor-type weapon to Megazord. Although, who is actually in command of the auxiliary zords changes throughout the show. The other contains a Drago Zord, which is to become the White Ranger's Zord. So, we have a White Ranger with a gold shield that starts off evil, is then turned good and joins the main Ranger lineup, and he uses a special sword with a Dragon Zord, which can also fly, a bit like a pterodactyl, or a falcon. So it's basically just a mix of Tommy's two most iconic characters. It seems that the White Ranger is able to tap into other Zords, 
taking control of the Stegazord and forming a new Megazord. Mesogog turns up to try and get the White Ranger on side, but he refuses and defeats the Monster of the Week for good measure. But when Tommy heads to a warehouse to recover a Fossil Finder, he finds a struggling Trent and realises the identity of their new foe, before being trapped in Amber. Amber, you say? Although Devin also found out his identity, well, sort of, capturing him on camera but not actually seeing it himself after hitting his head. Not that it matters anyway, as his sister ends up filming over it with her birthing video. This becomes a theme throughout the show, like in episode 20 where Devon and Kira get an internship at a TV station and Devon accidentally records her morphing on the CCTV cameras, only for the tapes to be dropped into Fruit Punch. It turns out that the Rangers don't just have individual abilities based on their Dino Gems, but their suits are also adaptable too, such as Kira's ability to glide like a pterodactyl, and also the diamonds on their suits can transform into spikes. During a battle, Kira is hurt and demorphs, but the White Ranger stops himself as it's still Trent inside. He comes clean to her and she tells the other Rangers, although he's then kidnapped by Mesogog. The power of the gems is making Trent turn evil and he goes on a rampage. To combat it, Haley sends them an Ankylozord, which the two Megazords fight over, but he's able to merge with the good Megazord to create a deflecting shield and drill attack. Tommy is eventually released from the Amber with the help of some radiation from a meteorite, but for some reason he's stuck morphed. He can't power down. This is actually because Jason David Frank returned home for a large proportion of the filming. There's stories of an injury, but it's more likely that he just wanted to be with his family in the US rather than staying in New Zealand for so long during production. So for a lot of the show it's just a stunt slash body double and then the voice is dubbed over in post. In the same episode we also learn that Anton Mercer isn't just in cahoots with Mesogog, he is Mesogog. And with Tommy incapacitated, Mercer takes over as the school science teacher. I mean, the principal isn't exactly upstanding herself, so I suppose she can hire whoever she wants. He takes them on a school trip to the previously closed museum, the one that was supposed to be a detention. Kira finds herself ambushed by some drones and is brainwashed into stealing a bone from Tommy's lab. It's the final bone to a dinosaur that he and Mercer have been working on, one that is capable of mind control. I don't remember that one in any of the dinosaur books. And what was this thing meant to be anyway? Tommy and Anton were meant to be creating dinosaur cyborgs, not monsters. I mean, I guess experiments can go wrong, but this doesn't even slightly resemble a sword. In reality, he just ends up being another monster of the week, but it does help spark the ranger's curiosity of Anton and why the monster was in the museum. And we learn that Anton doesn't even want to be Mesogog. He transforms in sequences that feel like they're straight out of a classic werewolf movie. Although I suppose it's more like a Jekyll and Hyde thing. Anton was working on something and tested it on himself, creating Mesogog, an alter ego. Mesogog's whole plan is to try and bring back an era of dinosaurs, so it's kind of like Cooper from the Super Mario Brothers movie. Honestly, there's so many references in this show, like an episode which is basically a Power Rangers version of The Mummy, and even Tommy becoming a version of The Invisible Man. Someone on the writing team was clearly a fan of Universal Monster movies, not to mention the Fly reference, the Dante's Inferno reference, the one where the Brachiosaurus emerges from a lake like the Loch Ness Monster, the episode where Elsa and Mesogog attack the rangers in their dreams like A Nightmare on Elm Street, and even the Krampus Monster. But it's not just Mercer and the Principal that are on the side of evil. Zeltrax reveals his real identity. He worked with Tommy and Anton when he was younger, but was almost killed in an accident. Mesogog rebuilt him, but his hatred of Tommy is never really explained, but I guess it's more out of loyalty to Mesogog. Now, this is where things get a little bit meta. In episode 19, Haley gets a new satellite dish which gets channels from all over the world, or even other worlds I should say, as that is the planet Onyx right there. And when flipping through the Japanese channels, the rangers come across this. 
According to the satellite guide, it's a Japanese show about the world famous Power Rangers. Abba Ranger makes an appearance in Dino Thunder. Although, technically speaking, it's not Abba Ranger. It's actually meant to be a Japanese show based on the Power Rangers. So they basically just play out a load of scenes from Abba Ranger dubbed into cheesy American voices. Who wants to try some of my curry? It smells delicious. Meanwhile, the Rangers just sit on their arses, criticizing every little thing about it. I mean, how pathetic is that? This episode has gotten a fair bit of criticism, mostly aimed at the dub. Some fans feel that it's making a mockery of Sentai and making it look like it's a bad Japanese knockoff, when they would argue that Power Rangers is the bad American knockoff. But none of the scenes have been reshot, even these ones. We'll get to those later. So sit down, Karen, just enjoy it. Meanwhile, Mesogog and Trent are aware of each other's other identities and are reluctantly working together. Although Trent, still being corrupted by the power of the White Dino Gem, squabbles with Zeltrax for position. Zeltrax frames him so that Mesogog tries to destroy him, but Anton fights back and manages to save him, destroying the evil encoding on his gem, or maybe his morpher. And so the White Ranger is now on the side of good, only Zeltrax is able to use the copy ability of a Monster of the Week to create an exact duplicate that is completely evil. The only thing is, why just make one? I mean, in the same episode, the monster creates four copies of Cassidy, so why not have a whole army of rangers? I suppose the monster had already been destroyed, so maybe there was only enough power to make one, but it's never really mentioned. Only Zeltrax ends up getting killed in a battle with Tommy, so he's just gone, even though the White Ranger is still around. It's a little hard to tell, but I don't think the Dragon Zord was also cloned, but instead I think the evil one now controls it. We also continue the tradition of powering up the Red Ranger with the Shield of Triumph, which is a shield obtained by Tommy and Trent, but infused with the powers of all the Rangers although he does actually get an even bigger upgrade later in the season. The ultimate upgrade is odd because it's a big mix of CG and practical effects, and there's just a ridiculous amount of power-ups that also includes this. Super stretch. So we know where Nintendo got their idea for arms then. He even has a dragon yo-yo, which even for a toy advert is a little bit on the nose. Literally. Although it's a little bit weird because the powers are meant to be fused with the user's DNA and can't be given up, but maybe it's because they're just temporary and eventually he can do it on his own anyway. But along with this there's also a whole new Zord, the Triassic Rover, but this one's more than just an auxiliary Zord. It's a massive chariot pulled by a Styracosaurus, or Mesodon Zord. This is also able to make its own Megazord, the Mesodon Megazord. Although, as we go on, the other rangers are also able to join Connor in the cockpit as well. And this is what I mean, there's just too many Zords and vehicles. I mean, I do like them all, but the more there are, the less of an impact they can have. Because it doesn't end there. There continue to be introductions and upgrades, like the upgrade to Ethan's bike into a hover chopper thing, and then all of the auxiliary zords combine together to form the Triceramax Megazord, another Megazord. And then right at the end of the season, Mesogog unveils a clone copy of the Megazord of his own, which bear in mind is a physical prop that they actually had to make, it's not just CG but it gets destroyed 49 seconds after its debut. Seriously, it has 13 seconds of screen time total. Again, I don't dislike them, and most of them do get a decent amount of screen time here and there, but the way something becomes iconic is when it makes multiple appearances in different situations. With this, things just come and go a bit too quickly. Tommy is eventually brought back in episode 27, but they have to use the power of his Dino Gem, and it ends up being destroyed. He spends the rest of the series in a dream world, fighting his former selves, the Red Zeo Ranger, and they're fighting in water. 
No, no, you know what? Dream World doesn't count. Followed by the White Ranger, and finally the original Green Ranger, with a shield that's a hell of a lot better than the one used in the US Mighty Morphin footage. The fight was apparently metaphorical. He was fighting for his life, and somehow collecting the broken pieces of his dino gem in the dream reforges the stone in real life. And now we get back to actually having Tommy in the show, not just the Black Ranger. He then returns to teaching in the school. I'm guessing Anton backed off when he was struggling to handle Mezagog's fight for control. Zeltrax then re-emerges in episode 28, but fighting for himself. And then Trent is forced to do battle with the evil White Ranger, leaving just him. And not just that, but the Rangers now have the full arsenal of Zords back under their control. And you know what that means. Another new ultimate form of Megazord. Episodes 31 and 32 are a crossover with the previous season, Power Rangers Ninja Storm. Now obviously we're doing this video out of sequence, so realistically this is something to cover when I do that show, but you know the score, it's a crossover that uses mostly villains from Ninja Storm but with the obligatory bad guy team up, and the aid of the Rangers from Dino Thunder to save the day. In episode 35, Tommy finally realises that Elsa and Principal Randall are the same person, along with everyone else, and by the end of the episode the secret is out about Mesogog too. But Mesogog has managed to develop a serum that separates himself from Anton. Initially the Rangers are angry when they find out Trent knew about his father, but eventually everyone realises that if Mesogog wins then Anton will be lost forever, so Trent will still be on side. Little do they know that he's already been separated. In the two-part finale, Elsa has her powers removed and she's thrown to the wolves, or more specifically, Zeltrax. Meanwhile, Devon is finally able to catch the Rangers' identity on camera. The Rangers recover Elsa and take her back to the lab, where Trent plans to try and swap the Dino Gems for his father, before opening a portal for the other Rangers, who travel there in a truck, of all things. Haley's able to destroy Mesogog's uber weapon, the one that's meant to return the world to the age of dinosaurs, and the island, once again, begins to explode and sink. Only Zeltrax followed the rangers back to the lab and starts destroying it, a la Ivan Ooze. They all manage to make it through the portal before the island sinks, even Anton, but return to find Elsa kidnapped and the lab trashed. But they at least have their dino gems. But after unveiling all those Zords, they end up getting sacrificed to stop Zeltrax's final monster, with Zeltrax dying in the process. And as such, it all comes down to one final battle with Mesogog, who absorbed just enough power before the island explosion to take on his final form, all while Cassidy and Devon are filming it, by the way. In the end, it's not just the Zords that have to be sacrificed, it's the powers completely, as it takes everything that the gems possess to defeat Mesogog. But it doesn't end on a sad note, because Cassidy and Devon realise that it's not worth selling out their friends for a scoop, so they hand over the tape and everyone heads to prom. But while we skipped over the crossover with Ninja Storm, because in reality that's actually more of an extension of that season, the same is not so true for the next season Power Rangers SPD, which is set in the future. There's a crossover in that season too, in which the Dino Rangers make an appearance, but they play a much more important role in that plot. So let's take a look at that. The episode starts with two villains discussing a transaction, while the Mecha Jim Sterling here, or Broodwing, has apparently procured the three main Dino Gems on the planet Onyx, and they appear to be powered up again. We then cut back to Reefside in 2005, with Connor and Ethan who are attending a reunion. But I'm going to pause here for a moment because this is a little confusing. Dino Thunder was aired in 2004, and for all I can tell was also set in 2004, but it's hard to understand the continuity of Power Ranger seasons because Lost Galaxy throws all things out of whack. In Lost Galaxy there's a massive leap forward in technology, and it's meant to be set sometime in the near future. But as we go further on, we get to seasons like Dino Thunder, where it's just set in a reasonably normal early 2000s. Which would be fine if they were in a different universe, but 
they're not. It's meant to be the same. SPD aired in 2005, but it's set in 2025. So we're going back 20 years, but there's a reunion for Reefside graduates after only a year? Why make it a school reunion? Why not just have Connor, Ethan and Kira meet up for a catch-up? But anyway, they're transported into the future and faced with Broodwing, but fight their way through and grab their dino gems. They somehow escape wherever they were transported to and are picked up on an energy readout from the morphing grid. While they manage to grab just their dino gems and they've been without them for a year or maybe ten, who knows, they seem to still be wearing their bracelets. The SBD rangers appear and recover the dino rangers, bringing them back to their command centre to explain what's happened to them. But again, this is only 20 years in the future, and we've got a super futuristic command centre run by aliens and anthropomorphic dog people. Quick reminder, this is also meant to be three years from the filming of this video. Not only all of that, but they've never heard of the Dino Rangers and have to look into the archives to see who they were and what they did. It's 20 years. I mean, we remember 9-11 like it was yesterday, but everyone's forgotten about giant monsters attacking the Earth and the superheroes that saved them. I mean, at this point, I'm reviewing Dino Thunder 18 years later, and it's the most modern season I've covered. And how did the gems go from being in the hands of the Rangers to being sold on the planet Onyx? All the while, the Rangers are probably only in their 40s in that time period. This always gets to me. If you're going to do a jump into the future with a story that requires time travel and things being super futuristic, jump forward 120 years, 220, not just 20. The new rangers morph to take on the bad guys, including Commander Kruger, but they struggle to handle them all, so the second in command at the command centre pulls their morphers out of the archives, even though their bracelets are meant to be able to bring forth the morphers. And why would they be in the archives after only 20 years? I'm literally wearing one now. And regenerate them for the inevitable Mega Morph sequence, but obviously no Dinozords appear as they were destroyed at the end of the Dino Thunder series. So the Megazord sequence doesn't last very long, and they focus on more ground battles. But again, I'm confused. Because at the end of it, they talk about the Dino Rangers not staying and having to head back to 2005. But again, the Rangers are probably there in 2025 too. Their older selves will be around somewhere, and not much older than Tommy was in Dino Thunder. Not only that, they're famous. Kira becomes a rock star, Connor creates a nationwide soccer camp, and Ethan develops software that they still use at SPD so they should still be able to find them pretty easily. And when they say still use, it's only been 20 years. I've got software on my shelves that is older than that. But if that was the case, then older Ethan would probably still be working there. He'd only be in his 40s, but they're talking about him as if it was centuries ago. How does this episode not end with Connor, Ethan and Kira meeting their older selves? I mean, I'll be 36 in 2025. If 16-year-old me was brought into the future, I'd definitely be there to meet him, and probably tell him to buy gold before the world's economy crashes, and also avoid chocolate. They manage to avoid the question of why they can't just hand the Dino Gems over and have active Dino Rangers in 2025, fighting alongside the current Rangers, because the Dino Gems apparently get destroyed in order to regenerate enough power to send them back. And then they avoid the whole problem of why wouldn't the rangers be more careful about hanging onto their dino gems, because apparently their memory of the whole encounter is wiped during their journey back. But still, why wouldn't the rangers hang onto their gems anyway, in 2005, even if they lose their power? I mean, I have a Morpher from 1994 and it doesn't even have any real powers anyway, because I was never a power ranger, but I still hung on to it. <sighs> I hate time travel storylines. And to make it even more confusing, there's a second crossover where the SBD Rangers enter a wormhole and go back to 2004 and get all the Dino Thunder Rangers involved in a battle against the main SBD villain and a returning Zeltrax. They then wipe their memories again, Men in Black style, and Kruger wipes the SBD Rangers' memories too, as well as his own. 
So despite the infuriating SBD crossover, Dino Thunder is one of the best seasons we've covered so far, if not the best. There's a few things that don't add up, and there's some things that could have been done better, but all in all, it's hard to find too many faults with it. The styling is good, the acting is good, minus the accent shifting. The action sequences are great, the humour is good without being too cheesy, and being 38 episodes rather than the previous norm of 45 or 50 or even 60 for the original series, it means that there's much less filler too. Even the episodes that don't form part of the wider story are still good, well, apart from the obligatory clip show right before the finale. But actually, in that one, there's still things that are key to the story, so even then it works. The SBD crossover was frustrating, but that's always going to happen with time travel storylines. That's not on Dino Thunder, that's on SPD. And I do love the sheer amount of hidden references and all the meta jokes throughout the series, too. I'll save you! Please, no! Whoa. And I thought the red guy was supposed to be the leader. Whoa. You want me to get this? Hideous mutant Ooh. creatures like that's news in this town. Let's get out of here. Oh. One thing I'm not so sure about is that everything is a bit more cartoony than the likes of the Mighty Morphin era. It's not just the CGI, it's also down to the designs of the Zords and the weapons too. Things have more of a brightly coloured, plasticky feel to them. I don't hate it, but it definitely makes things like the morph sequence feel less like transforming robots and more like something out of a video game. And it's hard to believe that some of the props are actual weapons or something high-tech when they just look like toys. Again, I don't think it's bad, and I realise that it's just the way things have gone with Power Rangers, but after reviewing the shows from the 80s and 90s in this series, it's quite jarring to jump forward to this. Surprisingly though, one character I actually quite like is Cassidy. She and Devon act like the Bulk and Skull type characters, except Cassidy is actually smart and witty, despite the slapstick comedy, like her trying to interview a monster mid-battle. Obviously she's a prissy princess for most of the season, and she has no sense of danger whatsoever, but she does actually try to be nice. She even dates Ethan very briefly. And when she has the chance to sell them out to get a big break on TV, she refuses. Twice. It's not just that she changes her tune at the end, you do get glimpses of her being a good person deep down throughout the show. And besides, Devon is just destined to be Ethan's best friend. While I stand by there being too many Zords and vehicles, what's nice is that in this series, Rangers are given custom motorbikes, and then there's actually some really good scenes with them too. Too often it feels like bikes are just thrown in for the sake of making a toy, they're usually really underutilised in the show itself, but not in this series. So you do get a good balance of things that are there to sell toys, and things that are actually there to provide good action sequences. Although one strange thing, I do get a bit thrown off when they keep using more or less the same drone sound from Ramsey's Kitchen Nightmares. Bring it over please. You're right. <laughs> Never would have seen that coming. Oh my god, that is the worst hamburger I've ever seen in my entire life. Huh? It's definitely early 2000s tween, but it has just enough wider cultural references for older viewers, and the right amount of nostalgia hits for fans of the original Mighty Morphin series to feel like that it's a true successor to that generation. But at the end of the day, we're not really here to compare it to the Mighty Morphin era, we're here to see how it compares to its Japanese counterpart. So now we've covered the US show, it's time to answer the question, Power Rangers Dino Thunder versus Bakuyu Sentai Abba Ranger, what's the difference? Well, this is where we depart for now, as this video is going to be quite a long one. So join me in part two, where we dive into the sister show and see what's what. I will see you all in the next one.